Good afternoon, Living Praise. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Esther, chapter 9 and chapter 10. If you have your e-Bible or your digital or your physical Bible, turn with me to Esther, chapter 9 and chapter 10. Chapter 9. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Ada, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities in all the provinces of King Zizis to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them, and all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews, because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. Verse 5, the Jews struck down all their enemies with a sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Pashandata, Delphon, Aspata, Parata, Adalia, Eridata, Pamashta, Erisai, Eridai, and Vaisata, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatta, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the city of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa, and they impaled the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Ada, and they put to death in Susa 300 men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Verse 16. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them and did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Ada, and on the 14th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and the 14th, and then on the 15th, they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why ru Jews, those rural Jews, those living in villages observed the 14th of the month of Ada as a day of joy and feasting, a day for giving presents to each other. Verse 20, Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Zerzis, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Ada as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy, and their mourning 
into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pearl, that is, the lot, for their ruin and destruction. And when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head, and that he and his sons should be impaled on poles. Therefore, these days were called Purim, from the word Pur. Because of everything written in this letter, and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should, without fail, observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. Verse 28, These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Xerxes' kingdom words of goodwill and assurance to establish these days of Purim at their designated times as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim and it was written down in the records. Esther chapter 10, King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores, and all his acts of might and power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews, because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, I'm Michael, a member of A Living Praise. Uh, let us now turn to God and ask him to help us. Our Father, sanctify our minds, our hearts, and our will by your spirit as we listen to your words. Allow your words to grip our hearts, our mind, and our will for your sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the book of Esther, with its twist and turn, can be made into a movie. Its theme, its theme of reversal will resonate with any minority people who are powerless in a world of power. Now, in fact, the German in World War II banned the book of Esther because it could inspire the Jew to rise up and fend for themselves. Now, for those of you who join us, uh, let me just briefly summarize what has happened so far in the book of Esther. Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews on a certain day, making use of the king's edict, which cannot be retracted. Now, this was an edict of death. But through a series of coincidences, I will talk a little bit about them later on, Esther and Mordecai were in a position to craft another 
things he did that allowed the Jews to defend themselves. And this was an edict of life. Now, in chapter 9 and 10 that we have read just now, we have a clear outcome of the clash of these two edicts. Now, almost immediately in verse 1, we have no doubt to the outcome of the clash. Because we read on the very day when the enemies of the Jew hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. I'm reading from the ESV version. Now, in other words, the enemies were killed, but the Jews lived. Who made it possible? God? Yet God was never mentioned once in the book of Esther. Not on the mouth of Esther and Mordecai, nor the Jews. Not even the author himself. The silence of God is deafening. The absence of God in the book is conspicuous. Are we to conclude that the triumph of the Jews was due mainly to human efforts? Yet God was never absent at all, even though he was not mentioned at all. His presence can be seen in the four points in the sermon outline. Okay, you can assess it either through uh, the bulletin given to you or through an online bulletin. The only thing I'd request to do is that in the first point, you need to change Second Chronicle, uh, the verse uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 25. That's the only change you need to make. Now, the first 16 verses of chapter 9 tell what happened on the day the Jews were supposed to be destroyed. A total of 800 uh, enemies of the Jews were killed along with the ten sons of uh, Haman. Okay. Over two days in Susa, the capital of King Asuerus, of King Xerxes. Now, elsewhere in the 127 provinces ruled by the king, 75,000 of those who attacked the Jews died. The number of those killed, over 75,000 of them, tells a stunning reversal for the Jews. What contributed to this reversal? It was the fear of both the Jews and of Mordecai. Now, the fear of the Jews was first mentioned or occurred in the last verse of chapter 8. And in that verse, the enemies were already defeated before any fight broke out because of the fear of the Jews. Then in chapter 9, verse 3 and 4, we have the fear of Mordecai. So let me read uh, the two verses. All the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agent also helped the Jews for the fear of Mordecai had fallen upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. Now what are we to make of such a fear of both the Jews and of Mordecai? At a human level, it is possible to attribute such fear to the work of humans. Esther and Mordecai, for example, had made use of whatever was at their disposal okay, to save the Jews. Esther used her position as queen to petition for the people. Okay, and she used her petition as a queen to bring the downfall of Haman okay, uh, in earlier chapters. Then Mordecai brilliantly crafted another king's edict to counter the edict written by Haman. Remember, the edict once written cannot be retracted. So what Haman did had to be carried out. But Mordecai created an edict to allow the Jews to defend themselves. And perhaps Esther Mordecai and the Jews saw their success solely from this human angle. For none of them in the book attributed directly or indirectly their success to God. But a discerning reader of the Old Testament would look beyond the human efforts 
For God has said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 25, even before they step into the promised land, this is what was said to them, no one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord, your God, will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. And when the walls of Jerusalem was rebuilt during the days of Nehemiah, in spite of opposition, we read in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 16, when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work has been accomplished with the help of our God. Now, these passages make it clear that the fear of God's people is very much a work of God. Therefore, the fear of the Jews and of Mordecai can only be the work of God even if God was not mentioned at all in the book of Esther. When well, Esther, Mordecai and the Jews uh, might congratulate themselves uh, on a job well done, careful readers of the Old Testament would recognize that God was at work providentially behind the scenes, behind all that happened in the book, in, in the book of Esther. Now, God may not appear in the book, but it didn't mean that he was absent. He may not be understood by the characters of the book to be at work. Nevertheless, such fear that we read about in Esther can only be the work of God. So God was present among his people. Point number one. Point number two, God is present when peace or rest comes upon his people. Why was the book of Esther written? The answer is found in chapter 9, 31. To celebrate the days of Purim. So we read in 9, 31 that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed season as Mordecai the Jews and Queen Esther obligated them and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their fast and their lamenting. The book gives the reason for the annual celebration of Purim, probably sometime around March, which is still celebrated today. Now, to sum up, Purim is the celebration of the Jews who triumph over their enemies. According to verse, according to 925, the harm intended by the Jews or by the enemies backfire upon them, upon the king. Now, we noted earlier that 75,000 of, of the enemies of the Jews were killed. How are we to understand the actions of the Jews to destroy their enemies? Shouldn't they be gracious uh, with their enemies? After all, in the New Testament, we are told uh, to love our enemies. Now, it is important then to understand the actions of the Jews uh, in the book of Esther. Such action in killing the enemies uh, must be understood uh, within the context of a holy war and of rest. Our pastor Kenneth spoke on this holy war last week, and so I'm not going to repeat what he says. So you please assess his sermon and hear what he has to say. But it is in the context of the holy war that we are to understand why the Jews are killed over 75,000 uh, of their enemies. In Esther, a holy war is meant to completely destroy the enemies. That's what a holy war does. In Esther, the holy war was a one-time response to the threat of annihilation. It means that no Jews can ever take the book of Esther and engage uh, in killing other people at their women fancy. It is a one-time response to the threat of annihilation. Now, two things we have to note. First, the Jews uh, defended themselves against the enemy. They were not on the attack. So we read, according to 916, now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend or in NIV to protect themselves, their lives. So theirs was 
that are more passive than active. They were protecting themselves or defending themselves. Second, even though the battle was already lost, according to chapter last verse of chapter 8, right? The enemies are still attack the Jews. They know they cannot, they cannot gain the upper hand, but they still attack the Jew. Why? Continuing in verse 16, we read these words. The Jews got relief from the enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them. But they laid no hand on the plunders. You see, nothing could quench their hatred for the Jews. Don't ask me why, but nothing to quench their hatred for the Jews. Now, even if they knew that the battle had been lost, they still went out to attack the Jews. Now, this hatred is also noted in two other places, in verse 1 and verse 5. And so, therefore, the author wants us to note that the action of the Jews are are understandable because the enemies uh, hated them. And these hatreds are uh, continued against Christians uh, today. For our Lord Jesus said uh, in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, these words, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hates you. For you were, if you were of the world, the world will love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, how are we to respond to those who hate us as Christians? Because we are Christian. Well, not by engaging in a holy war. The holy war in Esther is not a license for the Jews to kill indiscriminately, and it is not for Christians today. How then are we to respond? When people hate us because we are Christian. Well, by looking to our Lord Jesus Christ, by turning our eyes to him. For Jesus himself said in John chapter 16, verse 33, In me, in Jesus, you have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome. Now, these words of Jesus assure us that no one can overcome us, even if we are put to death. For Jesus has triumphed over them through his death. Our destiny in heaven, before the presence of God, is secure because of what Jesus has done for us. Therefore, no enemies of our soul can ever pluck us away from God no matter how hard to try. Now, there was, there, there was another reason why the enemy must be destroyed in the Old Testament. It was to obtain rest from all the enemies. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, we read, Now, when the king, that means uh, David, lived in his house, the Lord, now when the king had lived in his house, and the Lord has given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. What did the Lord do? The Lord gave David rest from all the surrounding enemies so that they no longer are a threat to King David and to the Jew and to the Israelites. And this is repeated again in the promise made by God in 2 Samuel 7:11. And I will give you rest from your enemies. You and I as Christians must understand the importance of 2 Samuel chapter 7. It is a messianic passage that speaks of the coming Messiah, of a perfect king who would rule over God's people. And so God promised that he will give rest from all our enemies. But the tense over there is will in the future. Now the theme of this rest from the enemies occur in a few strategic places in the Bible. Ask me if you, want to, if you want to know where these verses are. I will not mention them for the sake of time. So the Jews in Esther had rest from their enemies. Now, while God is not mentioned as the key player in the triumph of the Jews in the book, 
we simply cannot dismiss the celebration of Purim as Mammy, as we have seen in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse in 2 Samuel chapter 7, it is the Lord who grants rest to his people. Yes, Mordecai and Esther play a certain part in ensuring that the enemies are no longer a threat. But if we read our Bible carefully, it is God who gave rest to the Jews in the book of Esther. And so at the heart of the celebration of Purim was then a celebration of what God has done to overcome the enemies and to give his people rest. So we are, we, we are therefore to see that as we think of the Jews resting from their enemies, as we think of uh, what God has done uh, to, the people of, to the people of the Jews, we need to see that God is at work, even though he's not mentioned at all. And yet, it is possible that such celebration can be stripped of God's part then it is, no more than just, it, is, it is no more than just a holiday. Such celebration can degenerate into a routine, just as Christmas in many parts of the world have settled into a routine. The fact that God is not mentioned made it possible that a celebration of Purim is a celebration of man's effort. Rather than, of what, rather than of what God has done for them. Now, there are many things that Christians can celebrate when we gather together. And this is why we as Christians gather together Sunday after Sunday. And yet, it is easy to, for such celebration to fall into a routine. We are just going through the motion without any real content. Ask yourself, do you look forward to coming to Sunday uh, after Sunday? to meet up with God's people, to celebrate what God has done? Or has it become a routine with no content at all? Are you growing in greater appreciation when you partake of the Holy Communion? Or has it become a routine which no real significance for you other than just drinking the grape and taking the bread? Parents especially in our midst should ensure that communion would not become a routine for their children. When we lose the fundamental reasons for doing what we do at God's people, we may eventually lose the joy of being God's people. And so it is important for us periodically to examine ourselves, our hearts and our minds whether it's coming to church on a given Sunday, whether it's taking communion, whether it's being involved in cell group, we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Is God in our life? The third major point of our sermon is that God is present as the perfect king. Now remember, God is never mentioned once in the book, but he is still the perfect king in the book of Esther. Now, chapter 10 brings the book to a happy ending, a fairy tale ending almost. Okay? Verse 3 says, For Mordecai the Jews was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews, and popular with the multitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. We all like such happy ending, don't we? And yet, it is odd to find this word in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 10. King Ahasuerus, King Xerxes, imposed tax on the land and on the coastland of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia? You see, at the end of the book, 
Ahasuerus was still king. He now imposed taxes on all, including the Jews, uh, when he had actually uh, rescinded when Esther was crowned queen. But now he imposed tax on everyone, including the Jews. And it was he that we read in verse 2, right, that promoted Mordecai. Very easy for us to think that Mordecai was the one that bring himself up to the second in rank. But we read at the, in chapter 2, it was Asuerus who promoted him. Now, what are we to make of such inclusion in verses 1 and 2? What is the significance, if any, of verses 1 and 2? The significance, I think, lies in this. That while there was cause, reason to celebrate the triumph of the Jews, yet such triumph was not complete or comprehensive. The Jew was still a conquered people. And that is why they still had to pay taxes. Now, despite the victories of the Jews, the triumph of the Jews, there were promises of God that still had not taken place. For example, while there were rest from the enemies in Esther, such rest was only temporary. The promise that God made in 2 Samuel chapter 11 that he will give them rest has not come completely true. Now, during the period between the Old and the New Testament, the Jews once again suffered terribly. And we spoke about this when we were looking at the prophecies of Daniel. If you can remember Antiochus Epiphany, okay, who killed many of the Jews. In a sense, the rest promised by God in 2 Samuel 11 has not come to pass. And so we read in, even in Hebrew chapter 4, verse 10. This is what the author say. So then, there remain a rest, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has rested from his work as God did from theirs. We have not. There is still a rest awaiting us in the future. But this rest is assured. This rest is secure for us by our Lord Jesus Christ. God's rest is now made possible through Jesus Christ. But such rest is in the future. But Christian, all of us can look confidently to such a rest. Now back to the king, in chapter 10, verse 1. Now, the book begins uh, with the king uh, over a vast domain, 127 provinces. And it ends with the reminder that he was still king. This just boggles your mind. I mean, after all, the Jews have just achieved a great victory. And yet, Xerxes was still king. Now, as we bring the book to a conclusion, I want to spend the remaining time to highlight God as the perfect king and God as the one who reigns. What kind of king is Xerxes or Hasuerus? Well, Three things. First, he acted more out of impulse than careful thought. It doesn't seem to seem to us that he's a thinking king okay, who thought about his action. And, and there are three examples. One, in his anger, he impulsively put away Queen Vasis. But when his anger subsided, he seemed to regret his action. We read all this in, in earlier. Two, in his anger, the king impulsively hanged Haman. But who was Haman? The one he promoted to the second in command, no? Three, almost instantly, right, he changed his attitude towards the Jew when he himself was instrumental in the plan to annihilate the Jews. In Esther, the king 
seem to change with the winds, sudden and unpredictable. In other words, he was capricious. Now, in contrast, the God who delivered the Jews was not capricious. True, God sent the Jews into exile. That's why they were in Susa. They were in, they were in uh, the land of the Persian. but he was still true to himself. According to the covenantal curses he laid out in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now God said, I'm not going to read, but in chapter 28, 64 and 65, God said that he will exile them. If they continue, if they persist stubbornly, not to turn back to him. And that was exactly what happened with the Jews. Now, since God carried out his threat of curses, it could also be counted to fulfill his promise of blessing. And God promised to preserve a remnant of Israel, to keep a group of Israel safe. That's what God promised to do. I'm not going to go into all the verses, but that's what God did in the Old Testament. For why this remnant? Because from this remnant, God promised that his Messiah would come. If the entire Jews uh, at the time of Esther was destroyed, including the Jews in Jerusalem, then what would happen to God's promise of a Messiah? As you read through scriptures, you find that God is the one at every point when the Jews were about to destroy, he kept safe a group, a remnant of Israel. So the deliverance of the Jews in Esther must be understood in the light of God who kept his promise. What God did in the Old Testament sprung not, sprung not from a capricious nature, Therefore, we take comfort and gain assurance that the God does not act on a whim or on a fancy with us. The second thing we learn about King Ahasuerus is that he only looked out for his own interests, not the interests of his own people. Now, what do you think was uppermost on the king's mind when his young advisor advised a search for another queen? Or was it to find a queen that would not behave like Esther? Perhaps. But I think it was to satisfy his sexual appetites. And this was why he had another goal at the second round of virgin in chapter 2, verse 19. Now, why do you think the king was concerned with when Haman proposed annihilation of the Jews? Was it really to avert a national security? No, it was for money. Okay, because Haman promised a lot of money to the king. And the king seems oblivious to the pain that he has caused to the Jews. And so we read in chapter 3, verse 15, And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion, he probably couldn't care less about the people. In contrast, God delivered the Jews out of interest for his people. Here he in Esther, he ensured the preservation of the Jew, for he remembered his promise to preserve the Jew. Is it not then our wonderful privilege to worship and serve this perfect king? who is not capricious and who look after our own interests. We see a perfect example of God in the person of Jesus Christ in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. And so we read, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grubs, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant 
been born in the likeness of man and been found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's who Jesus is. Consistent in his character as God, Jesus became human like us. And out of his great love for us, he paid the ultimate sacrifice to die on the cross to save us from our sin. He is our perfect king. The Messiah that God promised is found in none other than our Lord Jesus himself. The last point, bear with me. God is present as a God who reigns. Now, I, I, I was asking, uh, sorry, Abigail, I mentioned your name, uh, uh, during the CG training and said, uh, how did your uh, one-to-one go? Well, you say that one of the things you struggle with is that every week they talk about sovereignty of God. Okay? Almost everything is about the sovereignty of God, how God continues to be sovereign in every matter. Now, it is possible. I, I, we think of the God as green. It's the same thing we are talking about. It's a God who is sovereign. Okay. Now, it is possible to understand the history of the world from different perspectives. You could understand it as people who have effected change. Now, this is why Times Magazine annually honor one person as a man of the year. Now, this is in recognition of a person who has uh, put into process the changing of history. You could also understand history as forces at work. You could trace, for example, how technology has changed the world. Now, there are other ways to understand history, the history of this world, but most historians would never see a single person or a single force as shaping all of history. However, the historians of our world will look at history, the history in the Bible is chiefly concerned with salvation history. Yes, we read about King Xerxes. We read about what happened. We read about the fact that he reigned over 127 provinces. But the Bible is concerned chiefly with salvation history. This is the history that truly matters as far as God is concerned. For when humans rebel against God in Genesis 3, God has been working out a plan to save a people for himself. And the whole history of the Bible is presented and need to be understood as salvation history. Esther, the book, is part of this salvation history. All the coincidences that we read about in Esther, God worked behind the scene to preserve his people. Now, what do I mean by coincidences? Have you ever wondered, why is it so coincidental that the queen was disposed, the fasting was disposed, and Esther became queen? Have you ever thought about, why is it that Haman, or sorry, a Mordecai exposure of the assassinate attempt of the king was conveniently forgotten? only to be brought up uh, at the exact point in time uh, where Haman was promoted by the king. Have you ever think about why is it that the, the gallow that Haman uh, set up uh, became his own graveyard? Have you ever think about why is it that in the meal, Haman just happened to fall upon Esther the moment the king appeared. And that sealed his downfall. All these are conveniences, also coincidences. And someone has said, if you have two coincidences, two coincidences right, it is one coincidence too many. Consider salvation history in Esther from a geographical standpoint. 
salvation history began in Genesis 12, okay, somewhere near Susa, in the, cap- in the city of Ur. God called Abraham and promised that through him, he will make him a great nation, he will, make, he will give him a great name, and he will be a blessing. That those, who, those whom he bless, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. The Old Testament, interestingly, in Esther, and in a place not far from Susa. I mean, not far from Ur. It was in Susa. Now, just as God called Abraham to save a people, God had just saved the Jews from annihilation in Susa. And we see the promise of God carried out in part in Esther. Him who dishonor you, I will curse. And that was what happened to Haman and his son and all those who hated the Jews. When Esther is understood as salvation history, we are no longer concerned as to what Esther means to me in my problem, in my workplace, in my school. We are more concerned about our place in salvation history. I'm serving the Lord today because in my polytechnic days, someone helped me to become, to grow as a disciple of Christ because he thought I was a Christian. I was not at that point in time. But it was through him that I came to know the Lord. And among those whom he spent time with, I was the only one among them who came in full time. God has a work in my life through the many, many coincidences, coincidences that take place in my life. The God who is in control of salvation history can work through a person like you, wherever you may be. Where have God placed you today? And what part can you play in our working, in the outworking of God's plan, salvation plan or through you? Now to apply the words of Mordecai, who knows that through you, in a time like this, there will not be another Billy Graham or John Stock or Timothy Keller. Who knows that as a mother, in what you do ordinarily, preparing food for your children, one of your children will not turn out to be someone useful in the kingdom of God, in the place of God's salvation history. One other point quickly. If we are to understand the sovereignty of God as a God who rules or God who reigns, we need to understand that in the book of Esther, God reigns not through direct intervention, not through miraculous intervention. He intervenes through the ordinary activities of life. That is how we are to understand the book of Esther. In all that have happened, that God is not mentioned at all, doesn't mean that he's absent. It means that God is working out his purpose through the ordinary events of our life. So never despise the ordinary things that happen to us. Let me close with some reflection. The book of Esther tells us that it is possible to live as though God is not present in our life. Perhaps this is how we, we, we ought to see it in the life of Esther, Mordecai, the Jews. It is possible to live as though God is not present in our life. Now, as Christians, none of us will ever deny God. But we can live as though God doesn't matter. For example, we can all attribute... Huh, all the good things that happen to us, uh, to our skills, to our abilities. I think of a young person who once spoke to me and said that, why should I thank God uh, for all the effort that I put in uh, in my life, uh, for all that I've done? Okay? If I am the one responsible for all the things that happened to me, why should I thank God? But he forget that in Scripture we read that in God we live and move and have our being. Every breath that you take is possible because of God. Every step that you take 
is possible because of God. In God, we live and move and have our being. Now think of all the decisions that you have made in the past weeks. How was God involved in them? Well, not at all. And yet the good news of Esther, according the good news of Esther is this, that God is ever with us, even if we don't think or feel that way. When we look at the entire books of Esther with discerning eyes, God is unmissable in the ordinary events of life. He was there in the pains and the struggles of the Jews. He was there also in the coincidences and reversals in their life. And so it is with each one of us. You are here today because God wants you to be here today. By his providential arrangement, we are all where we should be today. Ask God to give you eyes to see his hand at work in your life. Acknowledge his providence. Then give him thanks. Praise him. Glorify him. And why not do it later over lunch? Let's pray. Our Father, we are so comforted by knowing that our presence in this world is not a product of chance. It is not random in nature. But that you brought us into this world for a specific purpose. First of all, to know you as our creator and as our redeemer. And then to find our place in this world to serve out the rest of our day, fulfilling the purpose that you have for us because that is what it means to be involved in your salvation history, to be part of your history. Help us to understand our place and give us the wisdom, the strength, and the energy to fulfill what you set upon our heart to do. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.